Hi, everybody. It's Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio. Hope you're doing well. Very, very pleased to bring to you the latest news on the decay of socialism in Brazil. We're going to talk to Felipe Mura Brazil. He is a Brazilian journalist for O Antagonista, The Antagonist. Great name. And he has been ranked as the number one political influencer in Brazil on Twitter. He is the organizer of the best-selling Brazilian book, The Minimum You Need to Know not to be an idiot, also known as my morning mantra. You can check out O Antagonista at oantagonista.com and you can follow Philippe on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash blog, D-O-P-I-N, uh, sorry, D-O-P-I-M, blog, dopim. Philippe, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Anna. It's an honor. Okay, Brazil, the world's fifth most populous country, uh, seems to be undergoing late stage socialist decay. I wonder if you can take people a little bit through the history of uh, Brazil, some of the problems of the hyperinflation and successive governments, and um, give people a sense of where everything that's happening now came from in history. Well, actually, we had a military regime in the 70s. Uh, the military came to power because there were conflicts with the extremist left, left-wing groups, uh, they were putting bombs and doing something like this. And the, the army got into power and it should had uh, give the country back to democracy in six months, but they remained in power for 21 years. So the left was against the military regime, of course, and there were atrocities uh, in both sides, committed by both sides, like uh, torture, murders, and they were all wrong. But the left wing posed themselves as uh, pe people who uh, want democracy in Brazil, and that's not what they wanted there. They wanted to make Brazil a left wing dictatorship, uh, just as Cuba. And they had instructions and guns coming from Cuba, and that's what they were trying to, to make. But they changed history, and they say they, they wanted democracy, that's not they they wanted. But after 21 years, they come into, uh, they, they got the, the media, the universities, schools, they teach people uh, a wrong, a false history in Brazil. And they pose themselves uh, as, that's, as this, that how I am explaining. And Dilma Rousseff, our last president, was one of them. She had... She was in this kind of groups, the guerrilla groups, left-wing groups, and, and she says that she wants democracy in, in this. So we had a, 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 a democracy in Brazil that th there's no political right-wing side. Uh, all our political spectrum is like leftist because the right-wing side was demonized as something similar to uh, military dictatorship. And now we are trying to uh, tell people that that's not the, the right-wing values, the, that's not even close to a Ronald Reagan government or Margaret Thatcher government. And now Brazil is uh, having the consequences of so many left-wing government uh, that we had here. Uh, so they increased the, the, the size and the the power of the state and our economy was ruined by this. Well, there was this some is... liberalization in the early 2000s, right? The government shrank a little bit. It became a little bit easier to do business in Brazil. And a lot of foreign investment came pouring in. The economy began to grow. And then everyone said, great, lots of money. Let's start spending on social programs and infrastructure and basically bribing the population in return for votes. Is that a fair way to characterize that transition? Yes, because we had uh, monetary reforms there at the beginning of the, the years 2000. They were, they were made by a left-wing government, but Brazil needed money, huge state. And this government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, uh, who is a, a left-wing guy, uh, he started to uh, make some, some policies like this, uh, as you're saying. So the Workers' Party, which is another party, uh, uh, painted him as a right-wing guy that was uh, selling Brazil to the foreigners and this kind of stuff. Uh, but he was just doing something that, that the government need to have money. So he was selling 
state-run companies and divesting uh, this. And what happened is the Workers' Party came to government after these monetary reforms, which they fought against, and they were lucky because the economy was in a good track and our the price of commodities, Brazilian commodities were high. And Lula da Silva, when he comes, he came to power in 2003, after the campaign in 2002, uh, Brazilian economy was was growing. So he he fought against all the the things that changed Brazilian economy and make it uh, good, put it in, in, in a good way. But then when he was in power, he man, uh, he maintained this, uh, and Brazil uh, for s some years was in a good track, but they spent money, 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 and the state was, it became so huge that it became unsustainable. And then we had these consequences, the inflation, debt, all the consequences of the increase of the size of the state, which got worse with his successor, Dilma Rousseff, who was impeached in 2016. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that transition, which I think is is important for people to understand before we get into the corruption scandals, which are mind-blowing. Mind-blowing on two levels. Number one, that they're occurring. Number two, that people are actually going to jail for it. But we'll get we'll get to that in yes. a second. For people in America, this may be a little bit hard, uh, hard to follow. So let's talk about what happened uh, with, with Lula and then Rousseff uh, and, and how that transition occurred. Because he seemed to portray himself as a typical sort of barrel-chested, left-wing, populist, uh, I'm here for the workers. But his, uh, exactly. his uh, successor, the woman he picked, uh, seems seems to be going through some ethics challenges of her own these days. Yes. Uh, well, Lula got to power and he started to, to make these social programs uh, to transfer money from the taxpayers uh, to poor people. And so he posed himself as a populist that were taking was taking people out from misery. And... So poor people believed him because of this. But while he was doing this, he was yeah, giving money from state-run banks uh, to uh, Brazilian most rich, uh, richest uh, executives uh, from the Brazilian biggest companies, uh, construction companies that had contracts with Brazilian state-run companies too, like Petrobras, uh, the, the oil company, the biggest state-run company in Brazil. So there, uh, uh, the car wash operation uh, run by Brazilian FBI uh, found out that there was a, a cartel, that they were doing overpriced contracts to pay bribes uh, for politicians, and it all happened during the Workers' Party government. So Lula is now being accused is a defendant in five cases. Uh, now we have the sixth one, and he's accused of obstruction of justice, criminal organization, money laundering, corruption, uh, everything like this. So what he he did is he posed himself as the the one that people would love because he would give them money while he was uh, making these corruption schemes with the richest people in Brazil. Oh, and let's talk a little bit about what's going on with Petrobras, because it's a monopoly, or it's a government monopoly on, on oil, and uh, the amounts involved in the briberies and the corruption are almost beyond belief. So 800 plus million dollars uh, in, in bribes. I, I've seen reports that there have been up to $20 billion stolen from the company, which is half of its actual value. So the feeding fest of these jackals on the state-run oil agency is almost beyond imagination how how large, how how powerful the people involved are, and how much money in the tens of billions of dollars may have been just stolen from the state agency. Yes, yeah, too much money. And that's the problem that we have when the, the state is huge in Brazil. We have like uh, 139 state-run companies, Workers' Party, uh, while they were in government, they created more uh, 43, uh, and then it became 
139. So the people inside the, the state, they sell favors and influence uh, to people outside the state. And that's what happened in, in, in lots of corruption schemes in Brazil, not only in Petrobras and in, in other state-run companies too. And the money is huge. It's the, the biggest scandal in Brazilian history may be in the world. They, they stole billions of, of dollars of Brazilian taxpayers. And that's terrible. But fortunately, we had this great generation of prosecutors that have this ideal of justice, of uh, delivering a good job. And, and they are people in Brazil. Brazilians love them because they are investigating these politicians that Brazil dis discovered that are corrupt. And that's and if, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but, but the scope of this, again, is, is something that really needs to be understood. I know it's well understood within Brazil. But uh, these are the numbers that I found. They may have changed since this report came out, right? So of the 591 politicians in Congress, 352 are under investigation. There, yes. are, three, there are three former presidents under investigation. In many ways, the entire political class is implicated in the wholesale theft of billions and billions of dollars from the Brazilian economy, from the state-run, a variety of state-run uh, agencies, organizations, and businesses. It is almost unbelievable how far and how wide, in, in a relatively short period of time, this rot has spread. Yes, it's incredible. It's not the entire class, because, of course, there are some innocent people, but this old politician class in Brazil, people are, people are tired of them. And we have presidential elections in 2018, so people are waiting for this to renew the political class, because all these, these big parties, such as the Workers' Party, which we call PT, the initials in Portuguese, PMDB, PSDB, these, these three, they, uh, they have uh, lots of corrupt, corrupt politicians and tired of them, but we still don't have this leader who will come in 2018, so we, uh, we are living this now, that people are tired with the old political class and they still don't have a leader that come uh, to unite the people to the 2018 elections. That's the situation now. Of course, we are having scandals every day because this generation of prosecutors, they found out uh, too, too many uh, scandals. And uh, yesterday, like two days ago, two former governors were arrested. And we are waking up with this kind of news every day now. And the political class are trying to find a solution uh, to block these investigators. And that's what we journalists are fighting against because all the big parties are, are trying to make new laws just as something that happened in, in Italy. We, we had this investigation over there that is, is often used as an example for, uh, by the Brazilian prosecutors. And there the, the politicians made some, some new laws to block the investigations and, and they were successful. It's what we don't need to, we don't want to happen in Brazil, but they are trying every day. So the reporters, columnists like I am, uh, we are all trying to find out this information and to make people know what they're trying to do to, to block the investigations. That's not what we want. We want the, the, the ones who made the wrong things, they go to jail. That's what people in Brazil want. Well, and there is, so this Lula, the, the, the man who very, very popular, as you point out, very, very popular uh, head of the government. So then he handpicks uh, the woman, Rousseff, to, to be his successor. Mm -hmm. And then he yeah. gets into trouble with the law. Is it fair to say she, prom is the perception in Brazil that she ended up promoting him to a high government position in order to shield him? from prosecution? Because isn't there a rule that says if you're high up enough in the government, only the Supreme Court can actually investigate yes. you? So did she pull him out of the reach of the regular prosecutors yes, in order to shield him? Exactly. That's what happened. And they are investigating. They are investigated for obstruction of justice. In this case, uh, Lula was already a former president. Dilma was in power as a Brazilian president and she nominated 
him as a minister. Uh, so he could skip away, that's how you say this, <laughs> from the, the investigation uh, because the, the ministers in Brazil are, uh, they, they are judged by the Supreme Court, not by the, the these prosecute these, these judges that are doing a great job in Brazil. And the problem is that such as in the United States, the, the judges in the Supreme Court are nominated by politicians. So the, the Supreme Court in Brazil is too much politicized and like seven of the 11 ministers in Brazilian Supreme Court were nominated by uh, Workers' Party government. So that's all they, they wanted. But fortunately, we, had, we have this great judge, Sergio Moro, which is doing a great job and he revealed some conversations between Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff and some other minister that shows, uh, showed the country what they are trying to do. And now they are being investigated for this. And Lula was not uh, a minister. Uh, he, he, he didn't become a minister. Uh, oh, so he's still subject this. to the authority of the prosecutors who are going after everyone else. Exactly. He's just and he, he's a defendant in five cases and he's being in, in, interrogated and we have the images, the videos of him being interrogated and we point out uh, his lies, his contradictions. Uh, it's been like this here in, in Brazil every day, a, a scandal and every day we, we have to point out the lies they tell people. Right. And it, because he, he, he doesn't really have... Uh, uh, arguments to defend himself because the the evidence against him are so heavy, are so good, and there are so many evidence against him that he keeps uh, acting like a populist politician, uh, like he was giving a speech to the people on the street, but he's being interrogated by the judge, so uh, that arguments don't work there. <laughs> And it's laughable, and we, of course, we we make lots of jokes. I am uh, ironic writer, <laughs> and I I make a lot of jokes about this. But the situation is sad in Brazil, of course. Yeah, if you're being interrogated, yeah, if you're being interrogated, empty populist phrases, hope and change, they're not going to do you. Uh, social justice will exactly. not get you off the hook. So you're dealing with slightly more intelligent and perceptive people than the yes. general population. Now with Petrobras. I think the important thing to remember, too, is that Youssef, the, the woman who is, I guess, st still in for the time being, she, w at the height of these corruption scandals, she was in charge, was she not, of, of this company, and she herself has not been, the, the, I think there's nothing direct that ties her, and she's claimed no knowledge of these scandals in the oil company, but almost every alleged or convicted offender in this scandal in this corruption scandal is actually part of her governing coalition so if she didn't know about it she sure as hell didn't choose very honest people in in many cases to be in charge of uh, petrobras yes you're talking about juma Hussef, right yes yes uh, uh, each day comes out new evidence that show that she knew everything they still uh say they don't know they knew anything that was happening and and the, what's interesting is that m many partners of them were arrested. Uh, so you have Workers' Party people arrested that, and people who, who was there stealing money from Petrobras, they are telling the investigators what happened. And they say Lula da Silva knew everything. They say Dilma Rousseff knew everything. And even uh, the couple that were uh, her camp campaign managers, uh, they were arrested. And now that's the, 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 the biggest joke in Brazil. The campaign, campaign manager that builds Juma Rousseff with lies, uh, he builds her career, her, uh, uh, especially in the 2010 and 2014 elections, with lies, telling lies to the people, now are... Uh, this construction, I, I don't know how you say it, they're destroying her. They, now they are destroying her, her crew. They are saying what she knew, what she did, and especially that she tried to inform them, that, them about uh, the, the prison, uh, about that they were going to be arrested in a few days. 
So she, she tried to inform them so maybe they could run, run away. They were in Republica Dominicana and she sent emails uh, writing only the draft. So they, she didn't send the, the, the email. So they, they, they had uh, the password. Uh, Dilma Rousseff had the password. The campaign manager had the password to see the email there. She only write the draft. They saw there and they erased. But uh, she, well, Juma thought they erased, but they didn't, and they handle it to the investigators. So now Juma is accused of obstruction justice. They are corrupted people, and we have these incredible stories happening here every day. And even the account of the Syria, uh, the House of Cards, uh, wrote down on Twitter that it, it can't compete with Brazil anymore. So now there has the, also the been allegations here. that um, her her campaign may have been illegitimate because of um, uh, it was yes. illegal money that was used to partly fund it, and also that she covered up deficits uh, in government spending by taking money from the central banks and other places. I wonder if you could help people understand just how much of a cover-up and how much illegitimacy seems to be at the foundation of her presidency. Yeah, her, her presidency is illegitimate. Uh, it was built with dirty money from this corruption scheme in Petrobras. Now the evidences are very strong about this. There's a case in the electoral court in, in Brazil uh, to decide that uh, if the mandate was illegitimate or not. And, but she was impeached, so her, her vice president uh, came into power, and now the, this electoral court uh, will decide that if the mandate is illegitimate, Ill illegitimate I, I don't know, sorry, for Dilma Rousseff and for Michel Temer, which is her vice president and now the president of Brazil, or only for her, not for him. Uh, we, we have this kind of dis discussions now. And yes, it, it, we had dirty money in this campaign. The, the investigation is showing this. And you mentioned another, um, another thing about the dirty money with Dilma that I'm not remembering now. Oh, just uh, how she, uh, in order to make up for some oh, of the, the government banks. deficits, she seemed to have taken money out of the central yes, bank or she, other places? Yeah, th that's, that, that was actually the reason that she was, uh, why she was impeached. So she covered up, she, she used the money of uh, federal banks uh, to, to make, uh, to, in, in electoral programs. And she didn't, uh, spend the, the money of the government with uh, some things that some social programs that she had to pay. So the government should have paid uh, the the social programs and she put the federal banks to pay it instead of the government. So the government could spend the money in in the campaign. So it, it was all all wrong. And each day, Brazilian people are seeing this. And now she's trying even to come back to, I was doing a video just before this interview, because she's still trying to come back to presidency. <laughs> uh, although all the, this evidence uh, saying that Michelle Temer, her vice president, which she, she hates, of course, uh, is not legitimate, but she's not legitimate too. So that's the situation in Brazil. People don't like her. People don't like Michel Temer also. People are waiting anxious for Brazilian 2018 elections. Right. And as, as you point out in a recent video, Philippe, the government was spending four times, four times in expenditures what it was taking in in taxes. And were people aware of this at the time, or was it kind of wallpapered over or covered over by this money manipulation? It was all covered up. They, they, they always try, try to pose themselves, the government, as they had lots of money. And be, because of the campaign, uh, the, 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 the government has had no money during the year of the campaign, but they didn't want to tell people about this. So they wanted to paint the government as doing great things to Brazil, great things to people, 
and so she could be elected but and she was elected and after the election everything happened uh not as she told during the the campaign so in a few months people were uh, even people who voted for her were already anger uh, with anger uh, against her and that's what uh, made the impeachment process so strong and the con congressmen uh, gathered together to find the solution and she was impeached after a long process and of course lots of conflicts about this right now of course commodity prices helped to buoy a lot of this stuff up and it's gone from its high to its low down by about half and i know that brazil has of course with oil and and soybeans and other things a lot to do with commodity prices but this massive amount of government spending produces this illusion uh, of an economy this illusion of of income it's like eating plastic fruit and thinking you're getting some nutrition but now the bill seems to be coming due like uh, in 2015 brazil's economy shrank almost four percent and the nightmare for the left and, and for the economy as a whole and for the people is it the stagflation right you have high inflation and a recession and the worst that's happened in brazil since the 1930s the value of the currency dropped by almost 25 percent uh, since uh, Youssef took office in 2011 people are paying 10 percent more a year for you know the, the the necessary stuff in life is there an awareness like uh, that the, the the hangover has hit from the excessive quote partying of massive leftist spending from Youssef and uh, her government well uh, the, the price of the commodities were high and instead of making the necessary reforms they didn't they just increased the size of the state transferred money and uh, until it became uh, an unsustainable so that that was their they, they waste money waste money waste money and now it's they are with cynicism they they blame the international the, the the international situation the crisis of the commodities like oh we we couldn't know that the commodities price were going low so that's what happened in brazil and that's not true uh, of course when the economy is good uh, you prepare yourself for a scenario in which uh, the commodities will be low and and they did not do that uh, so the economy brazilian economy shrinked and we have now 14 million of unemployed people and uh, it's terrible and juma Rousseff is trying to solve her own unemployment trying to come back to presidency <laughs> <laughs> and we make jokes about it Be uh, and and Braz and michel temer his successor is trying to solve these problems uh without making the uh taxpayers uh to pay more money uh, to the government because people are tired of paying the bill for the corruption for the wastes the spending of the government and we have lots of protests about this and he's trying to make some reforms to solve the problem without making the taxes higher to uh, to brazilian taxpayers who are in the world maybe one of the most uh, uh, the, the the people that more pay taxes in in, in the world uh, and and we have lots of protests about this and Michel Temer chose uh, a great economic team to run Brazilian economy now. The problem is that Michel Temer is from PMDB and he and his party, they are not uh, saints. And in the political area, uh, we have still immoralities, we have still investigators uh, that are, are finding out some things about their ministers uh, so the people, this old politicians class, are all uh, in, in the same boat. And, but the economy is going in, in, in a good way. And it was going in a good way uh, at least until uh, one week ago when the president, uh, when, when the media showed the tape uh, in which the president is talking with, uh, to a uh, food uh, 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 company executive uh, who was being investigated. 
and and this guy Joesley Batista from JBS, uh, huge Brazilian company, uh, he was uh, telling uh, the crimes he was committing, the prosecutor he put inside the investigation to give him information about it. And in the audio, uh, the president, uh, he, he likes, he, he, he agrees, he, he doesn't say anything like, oh, come on, I, I'm out of here. Uh, he doesn't show this this moral repulse so it was a, a great scandal because uh, the president can't do this kind of stuff and their meeting was not the official agenda so we have a, a new scandal with this vice president that became the president and now uh, the economy the the analysts don't know if it will uh, make the economy bad or not but we have a good economic team working out for Brazil. So we've talked about some of the good prosecutors, Felipe, who are going after these corrupt politicians. But crime in Brazil, again, it is a country of extremes in some ways. Crime in Brazil is truly horrendous. I was reading a story of that guy was theorizing. He said, look, if you have a clean record, you can go and kill someone. And if you have good lawyers, it's very slow. You can actually, 10 years can go by and maybe the statute of limitations for some crimes, can you can really keep things at bay. And this comes, I think, from a lot of the leftist ideology, which says that crime is a function of poverty and, and lack of opportunity. And so you can't punish someone for committing a crime in this mindset because it's the environment. It's like blaming someone for losing weight uh, when they don't have enough to eat because they're in some horrible prison. I mean, it's not their fault. And so there tends to be, don't put people in jail, no consequences, lots of stringing along of criminals. And I think one of the results of that has been this skyrocketing crime right. I wonder if you could tell people uh, not to scare off visiting the lovely country, but uh, what is it What is it like in, uh, especially in the big cities of Sao Paulo and so on, what is it like uh, for, for crime for the average person? Well, you're absolutely right about this left-wing ideology that poisoned our law system here in Brazil and the criminals are not uh, well punished. Uh, they have all the, the easy going ways to uh, not go to jail, they stay there, they remain there for uh, a short time period. And people in the left are always saying that our prisons are overpopulated and you need to put criminal streets again, more criminals, and we are fighting uh, to, to, to make this system better for Brazil. Well, I, I live in Rio de Janeiro and, of course, we have here areas that you can go, you can walk on the streets. We have a life. We make exercises on the streets. We have uh, these beautiful views here, but we never know where there will be a, a thief that will take your wallet. It can happen everywhere. And, of course, you, you have areas that are controlled by drug dealers where police have difficult to go in because of decades of, of inaction of the government about this. And that's the situation, the, 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 the criminality, uh, this fear that the citizens have every day to go to work, to come back late, uh, to take a bus, uh, uh, the, the metro. The, uh, this, is, this is terrible for Brazil. And we are always trying to fight against it. But we, have, we need uh, to renew this old political class uh, to find uh, solutions about this because they are not worried about the common citizen. And uh, the crimes uh, they are opposed to, they are worried about taking taxpayers' money to remain in power forever. It's this taxpayers' money that chilled in this corruption scheme put in their campaigns and it's what's laughable is that in some parties there are who admit uh, that they steal money for the campaign but not for themselves <laughs> and so we have great stories uh, people that uh, inside these parties that found out that some of the guys were putting money uh, in their pockets uh, to 
to enrich themselves. And they said, no, that's, that's immoral. <laughs> but if you put the stolen money in the party campaigns, oh, that's okay. That's, that's, that's great. So that's uh, the best morality we have on this, in these old parties is this one. The, the people that don't accept you to put money in your own pocket. But in the party, it's okay. Well, of course, if you put money in the party, you get the political power, which allows you to exploit the corruption. So the money ends up in your own pocket either way. And one thing that struck yes. me, uh, talking, uh, well, doing the research for, for this conversation, Philippe, one thing that struck me is that, is there an awareness that some of the corruption starts with the people? Because there are all of these people who make these wonderful speeches. There's economic injustice and we want social justice and there are rich people are rich because they stole from the poor people and we're going to go to the rich people. We're going to take their money. We're going to give it to the poor people, which is basically just bribing people with other people's money in return for their vote. So to me, you know, I see all these pots and pans clanging away in windows and so on, and I'm sure that some people are you know, honest and honorable and justified. But the corruption, even to vote the, these leftists in, why do they get voted in? Because they promise, quote, free stuff to the people. And so the bribery starts from the politicians to the people. And I don't know if people have really connected those dots yet, that they've enabled corruption in the government because they've been corrupted themselves with the promise of other people's money. Yeah, connect the dots is is the problem in Brazil. We don't have very well-educated people and people believe in the promises of, of this populist govern, uh, politicians and they don't connect the cause with the consequence. But now, after 14 years of workers' parliament, things are starting to change. That's what I said in the, my PragerU video because people, even in poor areas, are are saying that the state, uh, the big state, is a problem. They don't want to pay more taxes. But of course, Lula da Silva have his electorate, uh, people who believe him, who thinks uh, all the accusations against him was invented by the media, and because he that's his narrative, and so people still believe the, 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 this kind of promises. And we don't have so many options of honest politicians in which they can believe and that's a problem uh, a problem uh, an education problem that we are trying to solve out uh, to solve uh, telling people how these things works uh, showing in video what they say in contrast of what they do and that's what i'm doing here every day making my own videos at home and doing interviews and writing about it uh, so people can be prepared for the next elections and, and show them uh, the lists, the, the names of this corrupt, corruption, poli corrupted politicians. Well, and this is really interesting it's, to me because uh, I visited. It's a challenge. Uh, yeah, I, I visited Brazil a few, a few years ago and gave a speech and had a debate with Professor Safatli, who I think could be safely said to be a little bit on the left. And oh, I had some wonderful meetings, wonderful meetings with a very bright and, and very committed and very eloquent group of Brazilians who knew their Mises, some even their Rothbard, and were very, <laughs> very keen on, on small government, uh, uh, free markets, uh, human liberty. And it was a very, very powerful thing for me to see. They seemed in some ways even more energetic and lively and optimistic than uh, even uh, libertarians in America and so on. And, and by the way, a little bit better dressed. But that perhaps is a topic for another time. And so can you tell me a little bit about the libertarian movement or the free market movement or the small government movement uh, in Brazil? Uh, how is it doing at least in the couple of years since I've been there? Well, it's 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 getting bigger, of course. Uh, of course, but the problem is you have to connect with people. We have you you, you should have uh, you should know how to talk the common citizen, and these people f who who wants to show the economic part of the story, they don't have these abilities to talk with people such as the populist uh, politicians have. So we have this kind of problem because uh, small government, free market, uh, it all seems too much abstract uh, for the common citizen. 
and that's where they they lose the 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 debate and we have to show some uh, a, a practical examples of how it happens and that's what i'm trying to do here every day uh, because lula da silva he he speaks he makes uh, soccer analogies uh, comparisons and with music and movies and and, and people are uh, and he gave attention of the people he he has disabilities to talk to people and if you talk to people as a, a bank manager <laughs> you'll have a, a, a huge problem to connect with with the common citizen and that's why uh, workers party won uh for elections because they are competitors they couldn't talk to the common citizen they were talking about abstractions and and people want to know uh, what will happen with their street what will happen with their their uh, what what they buy in the market uh, how they will take care of their home uh, how they will take care of their child and that's the things that are interesting to the common people. So these people who read Matt Mises uh, and, and the other free market, uh, uh, people who, who, who defend these ideas, they have this difficult. And I think they should go to the streets more. They should talk to more people. They should listen to more popular music. They should uh, pay attention in sports. They should go to the movies because they should use this uh, when they are trying to sell the, these kind of ideas. And here in Brazil, the left still controls the culture. And they control the culture because, because of this, they, they know that uh, a song that go uh, that people that have their ID, it's much more useful to to them politically than a huge article that six or seven people will read. Right, right. No, that's I... it. We, uh, the 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 right in Brazil and these classic economic liberals and libertarians, they have a, a marketing problem. And and I think it's it's similar to what happens in the United States. That sometimes uh, the right have this problem too. I, I think uh, Andrew Claven and Ben Shapiro they they talk about it very much, and that's uh, that that happens in Brazil too. Right. And the, of course, another big problem is that with every successive leftist government, you get more and more people dependent on income redistribution, dependent on state checks, dependent exactly. on state money. And then if you say, well, let's privatize, let's, let's liberalize, let's make things more free market, they look at that check they're getting every month and they think it's going to go up in flames. And that bribery class that people who've adapted themselves, their livelihoods, their existence, their health care, just about everything may depend, single motherhood, they may depend on the government and undoing that, you know, it's a lot easier to get people addicted to government money than to get them off government money. And after, as you say, a decade and a half or more, peeling this stuff back becomes very challenging. Exactly. It's very, very challenging to show people that you will offer them the opportunities, but they will have to work uh, to earn their own money and not being dependent on the government. And Lula da Silva and his partners, they are all saying that they took millions of people out from misery, which they did not. Uh, the economic reforms made it. And, and when you put people in social programs that they receive money without working, uh, you didn't take them fr out from misery because they are dependent on the state. And that's still some kind of misery. And that's the, the challenge. You, you made the point. Uh, it's very hard to convince these people that some other way is better for them and for the country. And they might be rich. They might get rich, but they don't believe they can get rich. They believe they should take this amount of money the government uh, delivers and take care of their child, they 
then stay at home and whatever. That's yeah, a challenge no, it's, it's we, like, we've got. It's like the people who give you heroin for a toothache. It's like, hey, you, your tooth feels better now, doesn't it? It's like, yes, but the problem hasn't been solved and the rot is just going to get worse. And then when you finally do run out of heroin, your life is going to be a big mess. But convincing people, and it's funny because in societies, to, to get men in particular to make big giant sacrifices, to go to war, to, you know, do all of these things. People say, well, you know, we, we have to have men will make the sacrifices and men will go and risk their lives for war. But getting people dependent on the state, and there's a lot of women in that, it's not only women, but getting people dependent on the state to make... 1% of the sacrifices that men have to make in war seems an almost impossible task. You know, if you could declare it a war, it's like you could solve the whole problem. But because it relies on individual conscience and morality, it becomes a lot tougher to solve those kinds of sacrifices that people need to make to withdraw from this kind of money. It's really hard to make that case uh, unless there's a real extremity, yes. you know, even worse than, than what's going on in Venezuela. And of course, everyone hopes it doesn't go that far. Yes, and that's the that's the point because you, you can't start to do this. You can't let people, intellectuals, they they can't let a government start to do this with so many people, uh, like what like it happens in Brazil with fifty million people because it's too hard afterwards to 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 convince them uh, the other way around. So that's one of the reasons I made this video for for Prager University to show Americans uh, to don't don't come in Brazilian, Brazilian way, don't go this way, because it's, it's too bad. And what happened here in Brazil is that people, that, I say a sentence like socialism always works at the beginning, because people feel happy when they receive their amount of money. But what happens is the stage goes huge. Of course, these populists make the, their corruption schemes, and then uh, we don't have money anymore. Uh, because the the income is shorter than uh, <clears throat> uh, the the wages are the spending are, are bigger than the income, so people uh, get poorer again, and that's what happened in Brazil. They got money. Oh, I took them out of from from misery, and after a few years, they are back in misery. Yeah, it's, it's like the guy uh, who stops uh, going to work uh, and just runs up debts on his credit cards and says, well, I've, I've really figured it out. I mean, can't believe these suckers get up every morning and, and go off to work. It's ridiculous. You should just lie by the pool having my tires like I do. But then when the bill comes due, the lie is revealed. So, yeah. And what, what's interesting about this is that some people remember the government of Lula da Silva as the government in which they had this money. Because sometimes the effects of the actions that you take on government only happens in the next government. So people blame death and, and this Lula da Silva's elect, electorate. They, they blame Dilma Rousseff and they think that if Lula is back, they will have that money again because they had this money during his government. But it was his politics choices that made this crisis that we are living today. And that's even uh, uh, harder to explain to people. Well, let's say somebody comes in and, and wants to cut the government by 10%. Well, everyone's going to say, that's austerity, that's terrible, that's horrible. But when the government has been spending four times more than it takes in in taxes, cutting 10% doesn't even begin to solve the problem. And people use this ridiculous word, austerity. Like, well, you can't have 10 pieces yes. of cheesecake tomorrow. You can only have nine pieces of cheesecake tomorrow. It's like, you're starving me to death. It's, it's not austerity. It's like a basic tiny bit of restraint from insane spending. I mean, I don't know how the, but this word austerity was invented to imagine people are starving to death <laughs> when you cut back on their ridiculous spending. Yes, uh, I think it's we, we have uh, this this cultural uh, challenge uh, to to teach people that it's important to work, it's important to to make your own efforts and to 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 be a, a good guy to uh, to make things uh, to other people too when you. You, you make a, a product and, and, and we got to say that the, the poor people, the, the mother that make a, a cake and sell to their neighbor, uh, she will, she, she can uh, uh, make a, a company 
of, of this if the government is not in her way, if she did, doesn't need to pay so many taxes. But the, the government uh, uh, make this, this taxes so high that poor people can't make their own companies and then they offer the alternative uh, of giving them money uh, with, without work. That's terrible. Oh, of course, leftist governments to love to keep. Yeah, leftist governments love to keep people dependent on government money because that way they'll keep voting exactly. for the left. They really are drug exactly. dealers of this horrible drug called fiat currency and and debt and inflation, uh, and they they make people dependent on this drug, and it saps their will for independence, for energy, for effort, for pride, for self respect. I mean, you can't look in the mirror and feel good about yourself when you're parasitical through the state on people who are actually working hard for a living. It destroys, I think at a soul level, it, it really works to undermine uh, people and it makes them frightened of freedom and responsibility and work. It, it How much it corrupts people internally, I think is even stronger than what it does yes. uh, in the mere passing across of, of bribes. That's only money. But what it does to people's souls, I think, is is much harder to recover from. Yes. And they, they don't work too. They don't have this career of uh, of, of works, uh, they they became politicians, selling promise, and they then they are in the government, uh, transferring money from people who made their own companies, from people that made jobs, and they're transferring this money to to their electorate, and stealing other taxpayers' money uh, through the state-run companies or whatever. So they, they are not workers and they sell these promises to remain in power forever. That's what happened in Brazil. That's the mentality we need to change. But of course, as we are speaking here, we have these marketing problems. We have this problem to convince people that uh, this is not a good way and it's not even a good way for them in uh, like 10 years or like five years, ten years, it will, they they will become poor again, and they will have difficult to live. And they'll be in debt. So I, I really appreciate the work that yes. you do. I want to remind people: check out the website for O Antagonista. Oh, antagonista.com. You can follow Philippe's excellent Twitter at twitter.com forward slash blog dopim, B L O G D O P I M. A thank you for the work you've done. You can check out his Prager University video. We'll link to that below. It's a great explanation of what's going on. I really appreciate the more in depth explanation. I hope you'll keep us posted on what's going on in Brazil. It is a very, very important, uh, not just for South Central America for, for the Americas, for the future of freedom as a whole. This is a very big country with a very energetic uh, population. And it is certainly my hope that we can do everything we can to push it more towards freedom and away from socialism. So listen up, millennials. This is a guy with experience. This is a guy who's seen, oh, Bernie Sanders supporters, this is the guy who's seen up <laughs> close everything that you want. And he's bringing back tales from the front and of a wounded culture and a wounded country. You need to listen to this because this is not where we, where, where we want to go uh, as a culture, as a country, as a society, as a species. So thank you very much, Philippe. Of course, a great pleasure to chat today. You're welcome. It's an honor for me. Thank you very much. I appreciate the job you're doing. And I have only a few opportunities to show what happen what's happening in Brazil to other people in the world. And it's like a, an alert uh, to people. So don't go this way. And, and please help us uh, to put Brazil in track again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate it.